issue this report on time smart pathways for Irish agriculture development. In particular, I'd like to welcome our Minister for Agriculture, Mike Creed, who's here on my left. Uh, he, it's great to get him along from his very, very busy schedule, and I know he's under some time pressure, so I'm not going to the day proceedings and try and move things along as fast as I can. Also, I'd like to just welcome uh, Brendan Halligan here on my left, who's president of the uh, IAEA, and Matt Dempsey, president mm -hmm. of the uh, RDS, and uh, uh, Tom Arnold on my immediate uh, right here, who is one of the main, main authors of the report, but he's also chief executive of the IAEA. Joe Curtin, who has done a lot of the work here on the report, is here uh, in front of me as well. So I won't try and welcome anybody else other than just to say general welcome to everybody and particularly to members of the advisory committee and sponsors who work with us on the development of this report. This initiative has started about 18 months ago and uh, I suppose the reason for it was both organisations have been toying with this dilemma of the two serious challenges that are facing humanity at the moment. The first one obviously is food supply for an increasing world population. And the second one, obviously, is to cope with the challenges of climate change and the impact of, of climate change on food supply in many, many countries, including our own. So both organisations had been talking with looking at what they could do about it. And at, at the same time, uh, this concept of climate smart agriculture was beginning to gain traction internationally. <coughs> Most of us here in this room probably have attended the uh, lecture series put on by the uh, EPA and Chagas on these topics over the last couple of years. But I suppose a lot of the issues weren't being applied specifically to an Irish context. Because we have a unique, quite a unique uh, context here in Ireland. First of all, we have a grassland-based agriculture. We have a relatively small area of forestry. And on top of that, then, we have uh, a very difficult uh, demands and targets to meet under EU uh, targets and international obligations. So when you bring it all together, we have a unique set of challenges here in Ireland. So during the last uh, 18 months or 15 months, uh, we've had uh, a lot of international speakers and national speakers looking at different aspects of the topic, and we've tried to bring the essence of what went on into this report. So without any further ado, I'd like to ask the Minister to uh, launch the report. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Um, I'd like to thank you for your invitation and uh, thank the IEA and the RDS for hosting a very successful series of talks and workshops under the Leadership Forum on Climate Smart Agriculture, which was launched by my colleague, Minister Simon Coveney, I think in March 2015. I was happy to accept the invitation to launch this independent report, a Climate Smart Pathways to Irish Agricultural Development, Exploring the Leadership Opportunity. I would like to acknowledge the work that Tom and Joe have done to deliver this analysis of the issues that, which were raised and debated in these talks. Interestingly enough, when I was appointed on the 6th of uh, May last, I uh, met with the Secretary General of the Department of Agriculture and O'Driscoll in, in the FOIA of Linster House at about 10 o'clock on Friday night on the 6th of May, and he handed me a pretty comprehensive FOIA, and uh, it was the A to a Z of what's happening in the Department, but he said there are two particularly important things in there which you might get your head around this weekend, and they'll be... Um, you know, pretty significant issues in the department. One was climate change and the other was Brexit. He said, we hope that one of them might fall off the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> we're left in a situation now where we have to deal very comprehensively with both of them. Uh, this report is a welcome addition to the debate on this very important topic. There is much in the report to generate further robust discussions amongst all of us who are stakeholders in this key sector. As the report notes, we are indeed a rare breed, uh, pun intended, in terms of developed countries our rich fields that support our beef and dairy sectors form a critical part of our economy. This, combined with the ambition of increasing our level of forested land, presents us with a unique challenge. However, unique challenges produce innovative thinking and groundbreaking solutions. It is my firm belief that we are and must continue to be global leaders in climate smart agriculture and sustainable food production as we are well placed to do just that. Ensuring food security for all of us and preventing dangerous climate changes are two of the biggest challenges facing mankind today, as alluded to by Tom, something acknowledged by leaders across the developed world in last year's Paris Agreement 
uh, on, on sustainable de development goals. While Ireland <coughs> alone cannot feed the world, it is important that people have access to a wide and varied diet, a diet that includes beef and dairy. It is equally important that this project comes from the most efficient production systems, which, given our climate, our climate and unique grass-based systems, is well placed to, to deliver. This is not Ireland being biased or sentimental towards its oldest and largest indigenous industry. It is something that independent research has confirmed. Ireland is one of the world's most efficient food producers in terms of carbon footprint per unit of output. output. With the joint lowest carbon footprint per unit in the EU for dairy production and the fifth lowest for beef production. However, there is no room for complacency. Ireland was never a country of heavy industry or of significant arable output. As a result, the agriculture sector, dominated as it is by grass-fed ruminants, accounts for approximately 45% of our non-emissions trading sector, greenhouse gas emissions. Although it is important to state that in 2014, agricultural greenhouse gas emissions were more than 14% below their peak in 1998. Nationally, the Environmental Protection Agency predicts that Ireland will fall short of its non-ETS target for 2020, and all sectors face significant challenges in meeting whatever targets are agreed under the upcoming EU climate and energy framework in 2030. The Commission is to publish its proposals in this regard to all member states uh, next Wednesday, along with an impact assessment. Over the past number of years, my department has worked alongside our colleagues across government to ensure that the Commission fully understands Ireland's unique position in terms of the size of its agricultural sector. This led to recognition by all 28 heads of state in the October 24 European Council of the limited cost-effective mitigation potential of the agricultural sector combined with the importance of including afforestation and land use, land use change and forestry as part of the future climate and energy policy. As an industry, as policymakers, and indeed as individual farmers, we continue to take steps to mitigate climate change. Initiatives such as the IIEA RDS Leadership Forum on Climate Smart Agriculture are imperative to drive thinking in this area, and my department was very happy uh, to participate. We must continue to implement measures to drive down the greenhouse gas intensity of our food production even further from its already existing efficient level. Our rural development program, worked over €4 billion Euros over the next seven years, is strongly targeted towards environmental benefits and will bring the latest innovative sustainability research and practices direct to farmers through knowledge transfer groups. Our unique beef data and genomics program will not only improve the environmental sustainability of beef production, it will also bring economic benefits to farmers. It will help to place Ireland at the forefront globally of beef genetics, enhance our reputation as a world leader in sustainable food production, and increase the carbon efficiency of the sector. From a marketing perspective, it will help to reinforce the sustainability of our product on a global market. The collection of vital genetic information can also contribute to the development of a genetic traceability system, which would be a global first, showing Ireland to be a world leader in consumer assurance and traceability. The benefits of this improved data infrastructure will be reinforced when coupled with the knowledge transfer element of the Rural Development Programme. The GLOSS Agri-Environmental Scheme creates an understanding of the need to protect the environment and encourage sustainable <coughs> land management. Farmers can choose which climate smart options to implement on their land. Local solutions are key. In order to achieve our sustainability goals, all of our agri-food agencies work closely to share information and knowledge. Due to this shared vision, we are now world leaders in areas such as sustainable auditing and have already personalized carbon footprinting and plans for more than half of our farms. Last year, stakeholders in Foodwise 2025 from the industry came together to agree on a new 10-year strategy. Sustainability is at its core. Foodwise 2025 states that, and I quote, environmental protection and economic competitiveness should be considered as equal and complementary. One cannot be achieved at the expense of the other. The strategy sets out a range of actions aimed at managing significant projected growth in the sector in a sustainable way while protecting and improving the environment. Its long-term vision of local routes and global reach is based on the continued development of the sector to meet 
growing global demand for traceable and sustainable products in the meat and dairy sector. Education and scientific research are also critical. Knowledge transfer groups aim that farmers operate at a local level. Programs such as Tagus Connected and our engagement in innovative national and international research will help the sector even to become even more sustainable as it grows. The agriculture sector's contribution to the National Mitigation Plan will be set out, will set out the steps towards further mitigation of our emissions. Afforestation is a major greenhouse gas mitigation measure that we are taking on agricultural land, and for Ireland it is essential that the EU's greenhouse gas accounting system should take account of the value of afforestation uh, to encourage this real and additional mitigation uh, from the land sector. We are also preparing a sectoral adaptation plan. Ireland will continue to be affected by extreme events such as recent rain and subsequent flooding, which have devastating effects. But we must adapt in order to become more resilient. This plan will be a first step toward reducing vulnerability and exposure to present climate variability in the agri-food sector. The issue of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture will only be successfully tackled if it is done at an international level. We must work to support agri-food producing countries in developing the necessary policy, technical and financial tools to ensure the adaptation and climate change considerations are the mainstream of their agricultural sectors. In terms of food security, Ireland's development aid programme has a strong focus on food and nutrition, including through funding from my own department to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organisation and World Food Programme. Irish aid has spent almost 21 million euros on agricultural programmes, 90% of which are climate proofed. Ireland has been very active in the field of international development action through agricultural research training and extension to strengthen the capacity of farmers in food insecure regions, thus enhancing food system distribution and resilience. Irish Aid and TAGUS collaborate towards reducing hunger and undernutrition in developing countries where Irish Aid identifies areas in food insecurity to which TAGUS can provide support. A good example of this policy in action is the work being done on improvement of potato yields in Africa. We recently presented an Irish case study on climate smart agriculture at the Global Alliance on Climate Smart Agriculture annual forum. We are also actively participating at the forefront of other international climate and agricultural initiatives at an international level, including Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases, the EU Joint Programme Initiative on Agriculture, Food Security and Climate Change, and the Food and Agricultural Organisation. We are founders of the Livestock Environmental Assessment and Performance Partnership, also known as LEAP. Our ambition is to be a global leader in sustainable food production. Ireland has a climate efficient agricultural sector, but more needs to be done to ensure that we are and remain the most sustainable producer in the world of milk, beef and other agri-food products. As stated in the conclusions of the report, to succeed in our goal towards climate smart agriculture, and global leadership in this field, we must be environmentally, socially, and economically responsive, and we must also be coordinated and ambitious. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Minister. Look, we'll move straight on to uh, Tom Ireland, who is going to outline the fi findings of the report in a little bit more detail. Uh, okay, this really is the global context. It's a graphic which uh, attempts to show the, the basic interconnection between uh, food security, food and nutrition security, and climate change. I think we all know that these are the consequences of succeed, <coughs> not succeeding uh, in one or the other. But suffice it to say that it is a global challenge of the first order of magnitude, which none of us can afford. To, 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 to ignore. And then the question, as Tom said earlier on, was where does Ireland stand uh, in this? What responsibility do we have? Uh, in particular, this concept that has emerged in recent years of climate smart agriculture. And it is presented as having, if it's achievable, a, a triple win effect of increasing agricultural productivity and incomes, of dealing with uh, dealing with emissions to meet an international obligation, and of building resilience, uh, resilience 
uh, to the increasingly evident impacts of climate change. And we've experienced that here in, in Ireland in recent years in some of our living. So it is a big initiative for a big challenge, and that was the background to the establishment of the Leadership Forum. And that has involved this 18-month process, working with stakeholders and experts to identify smart, ambitious, and pragmatic solutions for Irish agriculture within this global context. But establishing the forum was also a response to another reality in this country, that in matters of agriculture and environment, the quality of dialogue uh, that had existed between some of the stakeholders had left, I think, something to be desired. There was not a sufficient willingness, perhaps, to listen to each other and to take account of other people's points of view. So in establishing this, we wanted to, to, uh, to see could we address that, to also go on, a, if you like, a, a learning journey together. Our basic ground rules was that we were going to deal in good science with good manners. And we've done that, I think, to a, to a, to a fair degree. And while not everybody who's been associated with this would agree with everything in the report, it would be surprising if they did, I think we brought people along, along that journey. And this is the outcome of it, which you all have. Uh, it has involved uh, a great deal of work, uh, and I would again uh, pay tribute to the advisory committee group who have uh, helped along the way. Joe Burton has put a huge amount of work in, and Tom Curley has been a major, uh, and, and Paul has been a major asset as well, with, as part of the wider input from the ODS. And so I have now three or four slides which really attempt to capture what the report says. Striving for global leadership, uh, aiming at bringing progress to a new level. We want to be very clear that some of the, the things that the minister has already spoken about represents already significant progress here in Ireland. But I think we also need to be entirely clear that if we are to get to a, 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 an aspiration of credible international leadership, that progress needs to be brought to a new level. And what we're trying to do in this report is spell out that agenda that would bring us uh, to this new level. At the heart of it, it would mean the adoption by government of having climate smart agriculture and the global leadership in climate smart agriculture as a clear policy objective. And then you put in place the framework to support that. It will require high level political commitment and a buy-in from all key stakeholders. And it will require a whole of government approach, uh, which will require that domestic, high quality, credible domestic policy is then reflected in what we say at international level on the policy advocacy front. But quite a few of my former uh, NGO colleagues here today, and they will be all aware, and some of the rest of you may be aware, that there is a precedent for this sort of approach. About 10 years ago, there was a, a report of the Irish Hunger Task Force, which set out to establish Irish leadership uh, in this field. And by doing these things, having clear policy, having high level political commitment, having a whole of government approach and having buy-in from key stakeholders. They were the elements that over a relatively short number of years established Ireland as an accepted leader in the field of nutrition and food security. What we are proposing in this report are similar principles to underpin uh, what we are trying to do in climate smart agriculture. On the specifics, uh, this is what we are suggesting, that at, at the domestic Irish level, we develop a management framework to measure, report, and verify progress towards achieving CSA leadership on an annual basis, so that improvements can be clearly demonstrated and communicated. I think we all here, or many of us here, accept the progress that has been made, and we are selling that, if you like, as part of our national brand in terms of sustainability approach. But in that acceptance at international level has to be further enhanced, and that is part of what we're about. 
continuing to develop national emissions in inventories so that Ireland can gain credits from all on-farm improvements in carbon efficiency and the development of carbon sinks. And what the minister talked about there, about some of the response we need to achieve at the EU level, the understanding of policy shifts at EU level that is necessary, that is part and parcel of this. Aligning uh, incentives to promote dairy beef enterprises in the post milk quota era, as there are, these are car more carbon efficient compared to structural beef systems. These are some quite difficult and detailed issues here. We don't go into the level of detail to solve all these problems in the report, but these are at the heart of what if pro where progress has to be made if we are to make overall progress. This issue, promoting access to land to young farmers, is already currently government policy for some years. More needs to be done. Reconfiguring extension services in the light of climate smart priorities, including greater use of technologies that are now available for education, data gathering, and information. I would here take this opportunity to say, pay tribute to the work that Chalkisk has done. But we also realize that about five or six years ago, Chalkisk numbers, etc., were, were cut back. If this is to be a national priority, that's something I think we need to look at. And against the issue of forestry, very important, but there are a series of both financial and non-financial barriers to forestry, including relaxing of the replanting requirements, which need uh, to be looked at. And this is another important issue, that at the level of renewable energy, there are possibilities uh, within many rural areas to have more renewable energy on farms, more opportunities for, for farmers, uh, and that needs more support. And then, I think the really important issue, exploring the opportunities for all island collaboration for CSA. Some very good work has happened in Northern Ireland, some good work has happened here. We need to pull this together and work together as an island in presenting uh, the progress made. I'm coming up to the very end now, Minister. This is sort of the international field. Uh, the Minister talked about the very proud track record Ireland has in the area of food and nutrition security on parts of the overage, overseas aid, aid program. Part of the key element of that is the uh, existing commitment that 20% of the Irish aid budget is spent on food, food security and nutrition. We are making the recommendation here that, we, that the Irish aid budget of 30% be spent on food uh, security, nutrition, and climate smart agriculture, and that they, these sectors be properly integrated. Develop a strong programmatic and learning relationship between Irish NGOs and Irish aid around CSA. Mobilizing technology transfer to food insecure regions using public-private partnerships, potentially focusing on improving livestock efficiency. We have a number of highly effective and impressive private sector firms working in this field. I think more can be done uh, to support them. And finally, there is a very big issue coming down the tracks within the next two years, what's the shape of the next common agricultural policy? We're suggesting that it should, that the, the CSA should be at the heart of reshaping that agricultural policy. And that also should extend into some of the UN and climate change negotiations. Some final thoughts. I think the value of this report is it's an independent report coming from two uh, established and I would say reputable institutions. It has been uh, the product of a unique collaboration involving a wide range of shareholders, stakeholders. And we think by virtue of its independence, by virtue of this inclusive <coughs> approach to coming up with this report, this report is pretty unique at international level. And it can serve to tell the Irish story at both EU and international level. We don't claim to have all the answers. We, we acknowledge that there are issues we are raising in this report which need further debate. But that is part of the purpose of this report, to promote that debate. And that's part of our high level and not, so it's not technical. And if you want to read it all online, these are the, address, these are the, the, the addresses. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Tom. I think uh, it's, a, it's a fairly detailed report, and uh, it's great to get it across in a handful of slides. Uh, I think you'll have to read it to get more depth, and we'll have a chance in a few minutes 
uh, to discuss it in more detail. But before we do that, I'd like to ask Matt Dempsey, who's president of the RDS, to uh, give his Im immediate response to the report, and I think we'll open up for discussion then, if that's okay. Yeah. So Matt, please, would you? Okay, thanks very much, John. Um, just for those in the department, if you'd convey my thanks to the minister uh, for coming to launch this report, his, his input and that his predecessor has been enormously valued. What on earth is the RDS doing involved in something like this uh, is a valid question. Uh, but founded in 1731 to advance the economic and cultural life of the country, it fits in fairly neatly with what we are meant to be about. Uh, and I'm not going to go into a detailed history, but just to remind ourselves from a scientific point of view, uh, when Marie Curie discovered radium, we imported all the radium for distribution to the Dublin hospitals. So our commitment to the real application for human good of science is, was alive in the early part of the last century, and it should continue now. And that's the reason that we were so happy to team up with a remarkable institution, uh, and I'm delighted to see one of the main founders here, Brendan Halligan, the Institute of International and Economic Affairs, uh, with Tom Arnold as its director general, and the RDS chipping in what it could by way of organization, finance, and scientific capacity. I also want to pay tribute to the Department of Agriculture. Part of the great strength of a small country like Ireland is that all available expertise and input can be so easily mobilized if the will is there and real policies considered calmly and given to government as the considered view of people that have developed real ideas. And this, this is what we're trying to achieve in this. There's a few key ones, I think, that come out from my point of view. As a farmer, I've been acutely conscious of the carbon footprinting that Board Via and the Quality Assurance Scheme have been carrying out for the last six or eight years on the beef side. It's now being slowly extended to the dairy side. On the other hand, on the dairy side, we've been acutely conscious of the genetic improvement of the dairy herd through the whole genomics. We look forward to similar progress being made on the beef side, but there's no point in pretending it's much more tentative. But the fruits and prizes that can be garnered from genetic progress, as the minister said, are really significant because of the efficiency. We still have some gaps. Uh, recently, we were wondering, was methane now going to be excluded from all consideration as regards bovines? The answer, of course, is it's not. Uh, it's being excluded from the clean air considerations until 2030, but not from greenhouse gas emissions. So that's still a challenge. Clearly, the minister referred to the amount of greenhouse gases produced per unit of output. A key measure from Ireland's point of view in trying to stress the efficiency. I think the report brings that out well, but clearly that's on the negotiating plank for our negotiators as they tackle into really serious talks going on. Uh, mention has already been made of forestry, another key negotiating strategy that really has to be successful if we're to make real progress. We have been, and it, I think the report brings it out well, we have been highlighted, along I suppose with New Zealand in an international context, but leave that to one side, in a European context, there's no country that has been bypassed by the Industrial Revolution like Ireland has. We've developed straight away into the microchip age, so agriculture stands out like a sore thumb as regards the percentage of greenhouse gases emitted. It puts us in the target line, and we have seen, in my view, somewhat discordant voices at national level in saying what agriculture's contribution should be and how it should be scaled back. I think, at least at this stage, this is inappropriate, and some may regard it as unhelpful, but at the same time, this is an issue which some of the population feel strongly about and which we have a duty to tackle in a non-emotional but scientific and logical way. I was glad to see on the recent CSO uh, census data sent out to farmers to fill in uh, that they're now looking very clearly at sustainable best practice on farms and trying to get a handle on what is actually happening at farm level. And Glandia and some of the major dairy processors are in the same process. So the department for their negotiations are going to have really first-rate information, probably among the best in the world, as they tackle into what are very serious negotiations for Europe. The report, I think, brings out well the importance of sustainability in an environmental, but also in an economic sense of farmers. And this will clearly be kept centre stage, I think, by minister and the department, and also by farmers themselves, but also by the IEA, because this is a critical component if you get a society 
where there can be a reported 26% increase in GDP, and we immediately have ministers and other responsible officials coming out and saying that this doesn't reflect the real economy. Agriculture and farming do reflect the real economy. These figures, it's important to keep in context that we want to see steady, sustained, incremental progress, and we also want to fulfill our international obligations, but obviously we want to have a say in ensuring that those international obligations are tailored to where <coughs> Irish interests are not unduly sacrificed. We have the capacity to grow our industry significantly. We have the capacity to grow it sustainably, both economically and environmentally, and that has to be our aim. I was glad to see one of my fellow directors in the Farmers' Journal featured at one of our uh, seminars on this whole area in the RDS when we had a succession of speakers, and Mike McGann was able to spell out very clearly what had been achieved by way of carbon efficiency on his dairy farm in Longford. There are real examples of real progress at farm level, so let us try and build on that. This is, I think, a worthwhile report. I'd really like to thank all those involved. Ta Tom, thank you for your encouragement. Tom Arnold, thank you for your encouragement and help. Tom Curley, thank you for your real devotion to getting it across the line where it encapsulates so much of what we believe in and what we should believe in as a nation. We look forward to continuing this work with all of us involved in farming and the agri-sector and looking to build a never more prosperous future for the agri-food sector. So again, please convey, those of you from the department here, my thanks to the Minister, both for launching it by his predecessor Simon Coveney and coming here to launch it during days of some political turmoil here, uh, but real political upheavals across the sea. So let's hope that we continue to strike a happy balance. Thank you very much. <coughs> Brendan Halligan, uh, Chairman of the IEA, would like to make a couple of quick comments, please, Brendan. I've been coming into Boswell's Hotel and I've been into this room for about 50 years uh, to various uh, public meetings and uh, press conferences and launches of reports. And I can quite honestly say I've never seen a bigger one. I think the fact that so many people have come and that the report was launched by the Minister is a, has already ensured that it is a success. And uh, I want to particularly thank the RDS, uh, which was President Matt Dempsey and, uh, and Tom, uh, for the collaboration, uh, the partnership that we have created with, with them. It's been a very fruitful one. It's the most august and uh, prestigious organisation of its type in the country. Since 1731, has been pursuing the national interest uh, in the area of science and agriculture in particular, as well as the arts. And that made it a very apt and appropriate uh, partner for us in this area of climate change, which we began to work on um, over 10 years ago. We were the first organization to put it on uh, an agenda, and it's been a slow burner, if we give that fun. Um, <coughs> the best collaborative, collaborative partner we could have found was the RDS. And particularly Matt is a dear friend uh, who was a founder member of the Institute himself. Uh, and I think that the, uh, the success of today is going to be a, a harbinger of what it is we can achieve in, in, in the future, which I'll come to in a second. Um, quite clearly, I want to thank Tom uh, Curley, who's uh, chaired the steering committee, uh, his colleague Paul, uh, and I especially want to thank uh, Tom Arnold, who made the presentation earlier, whose brainchild this is, uh, and who's put an enormous amount of work, not just at the intellectual level, but at the organisational level, in, in producing uh, a template that we have never had before. Uh, there's a huge number of, um, of, 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 of people involved in this, organisations or whatever, and in fact it's the biggest collaborative effort that we in the Institute have achieved for the last 16 years, not since the year 2000 when we produced the report on the Agenda 2000 and we had anything remotely approaching this. And I think much of the credit belongs to his um, very many skills. And I also want to thank Joe Curtin, uh, who, believe it or not, entered the Institute as a, a very callow youth, as, a, <laughs> as a, an intern, a step researcher, and he you now clearly uh, midway through what is already a very distinguished career, uh, seeing a fellow now in the Institute in climate change. And uh, I just not only uh, admire uh, his great expertise, but above all, I love his enthusiasm and his commitment. 
which are absolutely irreproachable. So where do we go from here? I think the point I want to make uh, particularly is that this report is only the beginning. Uh, it's almost like a, a short prologue to a Shakespearean play. It's about 10 seconds uh, out of the production that's going to go on for two and a half hours. The importance of it is that we've begun to sketch the agenda. And we've begun to put this in, in context. And we've made the start. Most particularly the start we have made, uh, it's the point that Tom uh, Arnold uh, stressed in his presentation, is bringing together a community of interests who might not otherwise have talked with each other, or to the extent that they would have talked at each other, would have been antagonists, rather than what we are now, partners in what we recognize to be an extraordinary, difficult, complex task. There is an inherent dilemma which has been mentioned from the floor many times, of increasing agricultural production, which is going to have to happen worldwide, and simultaneously reducing carbon emissions. Now, we obviously do not have the solutions at this point, either technically, or in terms of policy. But this report begins to pose the questions and begins to suggest some of the answers. And that's what's most significant. I thought in, in many ways uh, the, almost the vindication of this, of this great experiment that we're engaged in now has been the engagement and involvement of the Department of Agriculture. I think it's important for us to remember that this is the oldest Department of State. It precedes long, by, by decades, it precedes the establishment of the state. And it has a particular culture of great responsibility and devotion to the national interest, but also great courage in confronting issues. And I think the fact that the department, from the very beginning, supported this project was the greatest encouragement that we could have had, but um, it was have been expected. The presence of uh, Minister Colby in launching the project the present day of Minister Creed in launching the report are themselves the greatest encouragement that we uh, could have received. But they are the greatest example, physical example, of their commitment to this. So let us, uh, I think, take great heart from the fact that this report has been published uh, in the way in which it has appeared. Let us take heart in the fact that we have all worked with each other and we have found so much in common with each other rather than and then what would this unite us? And as I said at the very beginning, this is just a start. Uh, I'm going to make a plug now to the distinguished president of the RDS, <coughs> uh, that he and I might agree that we will continue this partnership. Not only in the area of climate smart agriculture, but in a larger ambition that we have in the whole area of being climate smart. And that is to say, I would want us to go on with climate smart transport. I want us to go with climate smart cities. Yeah, yeah. And I also want us to get into something very tricky and very difficult, and that is climate smart energy. And I say this as somebody, and I will admit to this, uh, having been a sinner in the past, I was chairman of Board of Nona for 10 years. <laughs> but under my chairmanship, we built the first wind farm in Ireland on Bellicari 25 years ago. But I've also been a member of Antashka for 40 years. So we're going to get involved in climate smart energy, and it's that combination of energy and, uh, and climate smart agriculture I think that will have the biggest impact on uh, our ability to not only meet our emissions targets, but to exceed them. Because ultimately we've got to get to a carbon neutral economy and a carbon neutral society. That's the great challenge that's ahead of us. This has been a start. I think it's a great start and we could not have had better partners. Thank you to the audience. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you very much for your well-chosen words. Uh, look, at, I'm not going to name much longer, but just to make a few personal comments on the whole process. First of all, I'd have to agree with Tom Arnold. Two things that we experienced during this process, first of all, it was very good listening. People listen respectfully to each other's points of view and help to develop the points of view and develop the discussion. And you have the first thing. Second thing was the science, quality of science. And I, I personally haven't spent a career in, in Chagas and the Department of Agriculture. I was really impressed to see that, uh, uh, how the quality of the science here in Ireland has developed over the last uh, 10, 15 years. It really is outstanding. 
the one negative I would have on this one is that already we've lost some of that team of experts that we've built up here over the last 10, 15 years. Some serious members of that team have been lost quite recently to the team. And but Roger Schulte is a case in point. He gave an amazing uh, presentation out in the IEA and he, he's gone. Other people have moved on in, in their careers as well. And I think it's important that we continue to develop the capacity here in Ireland to focus science on the challenges facing this country, because some of them are quite unique. So we really need to, to, to reinforce uh, uh, our, our scientific capacity uh, here. Just again, and last thing, I want to thank everybody who helped us and assisted us over the last 18 months during this process. <coughs> Obviously the two ministers, uh, uh, but uh, Simon, Simon Covey who launched it, and Michael Creed now, who, who, uh, sorry, who launched the process, and uh, um, Michael Creed who launched the, the, the report. Um, Obviously, it's been, it's been a pleasure for me to work with uh, the IEA. Uh, Tom Arnold and myself go back a long way, uh, longer than we can both care to remember. Uh, but it was great to, 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 to re-engage on, on, on this topic. I say both organisations have been very keen to do something about it. I, well, again, the participants and the advisory committee and the participants in our workshops came along, gave us their time, gave us their expertise, and we really do appreciate it. Joe Curtin, I think, deserves a very special mention. Joe uh, did an awful lot of work in terms of drafting, uh, organisation, drafting, and all the rest. And took, I say, we carefully diverted any stick towards Joe. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Joe deserves our credit uh, and, and thanks for all, all his work. Paul uh, Farley in the RDS, Paul has been an absolute wonderful uh, help and supporter. And last but no means, these, our own committee, uh, Agriculture and Rural Affairs in the RDS, I'd like to thank them. So look, thank you very much for coming along today. Read the report and I hope you get something useful out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.